got friends only want to talk business. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I got expensive, cause when is expensive. I've been reading all the work. And I've been shutting down the stars. And welcome to Put That Coffee Down, the Freight Sales Show for Closers. Here with another exciting episode. My name is Kevin Hill here with Richie Daigle. And we're ready to talk about sales, about talking niches. We're going to talk about a niche today, and niches have the riches. So I always love talking uh, about niches. So we're going to have Ger Jared Flynn. He is the um, co-founder and managing partner from bulkloads.com. It's a load board for dry bulk and liquid bulk, a very niche market that is sizable, though. It's sizable, and they've built that over, over time. And it's, it's an, actually, it's a great product. I used to use it as a freight broker myself whenever I was doing bulk loads, so I highly recommend it. Uh, but yeah, how's, how's life in, in Richie Daigle's corner? Doing, doing great. Good to have you back from California. I know. It's, it's good to be back. It was hot out there, but it was a lot of fun. Played some really bad golf. And now I'm back in the rain in Chattanooga. And uh, not much has changed. You know, Jacob, De, Jacob DeGrom is still the greatest pitcher in baseball right now. Yes. By, by leaps and bounds, really. Yes. Is yeah. that ever going to change, Richie? The, the only argument there, in, in my opinion, is uh, maybe an Otani because Otani can also hit bombs. But as a just an actual pitcher, yeah. Yeah. DeGrom's doing some special things right now. So in the first couple months of the season, right, he's 5-2, and two, which is good for the Mets. You know, your <laughs> win-loss win record if, you, yeah. if you're pitching for the Mets can't always be that great. But 5-2, and two, a 0 0.62 ERA. So I just want to throw that out there. 0 0.62. Silly. It is silly. It's silly, yeah. It's, it's like video games. I think he set a record for the most pitches thrown in Major League Baseball over 100 miles an hour in a single outing. Yeah. However, the record for most pitches thrown in professional baseball over 100 miles an hour in a single outing was by a, a Chattanooga Lookouts player this year. It, it uh, was, Hunter yeah. Hunter Green. So. Have you seen him pitch yet? Not yet. Um, I'm looking forward to it, though. I'm trying to find the time. So. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So let's, uh, let's talk about Surge Transportation. Uh, our sponsor today, Surge Transportation, is the fastest growing 3PL in the wood, fastest growing 3PL in the logistics space today. Based in Chicago and Jacksonville, they offer unrestricted access to almost all accounts, limitless care territory, and a chance to be a key player in a growing company. To find out more, email jobs at surgetransportation.com. Great 3PL there. Yeah. Surge transportation. So yeah, so uh, let's talk about well, let's talk about transportation and premiums and you know if, if you go out and buy a differentiated product, which means a branded product, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I have to, to, to throw down the F economic terms to keep up with Anthony Smith sometimes, but yeah. uh, a differentiated product, a branded product, you're gonna pay a premium because of why, Richie. Premiums are going to be above the, the market average, right? So you mm -hmm. got it, you have to pay a little bit extra for that differentiation. So. You do, you do, and, and it's that perceived, at least perceived, right? Perceived value above the average. Exactly. You know, there might be real tangible value there as well, and oftentimes there is. And so I think it's difficult, you know, and maybe we could get into this a bit, but kind of dividing premiums versus elevated cost. Yes. Right, because all of the costs are elevated at the moment. Everyone's saying, hey, my transportation costs are 5X or well, 4X. If, so. if you're paying more for transportation to, today than you were a year ago or two years ago, you, you think you know, the more you pay, the better service you get. And, and most things out there, you're paying that premium, you know, that, that increased price to have better service, to have better value. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really work like that. In, in, in transportation, does it? Yeah, and, you know, what are, what are you getting for that premium, really? So you have your, what you've projected upon the situation or what your perceptions are for what you think that you're getting for paying that extra, mm -hmm. but then you have reality. And reality doesn't always line up with our perceptions. <laughs> right. it, it, it doesn't, because the premium, as we go back to, right, is that, that, that premium or that price above the average. Well, if the average, you know, average line hole rates have gone from, say, $1.80 to $3.80. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you're not really paying a premium. You're still paying that, that average, right? The average is elevated. So your costs are elevated, but you're not getting anything extra for it. You're not. You're, you're probably getting worse <laughs> for it, right? Yeah. And, and part of that is, is, is as transportation rates go up, you have capacity crunches, you have emergencies, you have a lot of things, a lot of fires going on, a lot of things going wrong. You have containers sitting on a ship for how many days? Oh yeah, I mean, there's containers out there that are sitting for 80, 100 plus days mm -hmm. or just sitting in the ocean. And I think you have to realize that there is major stress on all the various components throughout transportation and supply chain right now. And when you put that stress on all the various components, things start breaking, right? People mm -hmm. are saying, I, I want to sell this, uh, this capacity. I want to get this business. Let me, let me price this. Let me quote this. I'll quote a premium. I'm sure I can cover it for that. And then they're biting off more than they can chew. Things they're not able to, to follow through. That service isn't there. Um, I, th I think all this is taking place right now. It, it is. It, it is. It, it definitely is. It's, it's taking place, and it's been a long time. It's taken place over the last 12 months, and what you find is that though there's premiums uh, are even higher, right? I mean, because the service levels, you're, you're paying more, you're paying almost double sometimes for your transportation, um, and, and you're charging double, but you're, you're staying with the, the same service levels, the same kind of value propositions, just because the market's moved. And and again, service levels sometimes go down. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're in the soft market like we were in, in 2019, and I think we might have a sonar chart here uh, that, that shows the, the OTRI. Here, there we go. The outbound tender rejection index over time, you see in 2019, uh, you have sub 10% OTRI, right? Which means a very loose capacity environment. Rates are low. Services is actually better because everyone is jumping on any load they can, and they are providing the best service to, to keep their customers, right? And then you run into the, the last few months, you know, I, I keep on saying last few months, but it's been almost a year now or more That's that we've been in yeah. this, this environment, and you know, it's, it's hard to get trucks, right? So shippers are missing their delivery dates, right? Shippers aren't getting inventory in, you know, because of ocean. There, there's a lot of chaos and confusion and service, levels have gone down across the board, right? From the, the shipping carriers to the trucking carriers to the shippers themselves to their customers because of these emergencies. And it's not a linear situation. This is a complex problem that we're looking at because you could argue in 2019, sure, it was great for shippers, right? Mm -hmm. But it was not a good year if you were a truckload carrier, no. you know? And, and so what is a healthy market, you know? And is there such thing as a healthy marketplace for all the parties that are involved in the market, the, the brokers, the carriers, and the shippers, where you know, can you balance out premiums and rates as, along with service and find conditions that are, are, are meeting needs or mutually beneficial? I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that it's a complex situation and it's not, it's not linear. It's not linear and life is not linear. No, either, not right? All. I mean, not that's one of the, the most important lessons in life is it's not linear. Uh, you, you can go, uh, go along, you know, you make those hundred phone calls, right? No, mm -hmm. no, no, hang up, no, 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 no. But that one, that hundred and first call maybe could change your life. It could. You can make a hundred phone calls and have 50 of them be amazing one day and make 200 phone calls the next day and none of them work, right? So there's, yeah. it, and sometimes, you know, we, we try to find formulas and formulate everything and say, here's what's worked historically. We found that this, this set of actions worked out for us, but that only betters your probability a certain, to a certain extent for going forward because things are always dynamic and changing. So it's you have to be more in depth with thinking to figure out what's going to work going forward. I think there was a philosopher who said, you know, life could only be understood looking backwards, but you have to live it going forward. And uh, there's, that's there's, profound. There's some wisdom there. But there is some wisdom. <clears throat> you have to be bumptious too. Yeah, it helps. It, it does. It, it does. You have to, have to, to, to go out there and be bumptious, you know, which is the word of the day, yep. which, is, which is good. <laughs> I just threw it in there. Uh, so yeah, so 
So yeah, so it, it's always interesting. I always find it fascinating, especially in in markets like like we find ourselves in transportation, is that the more you pay, oftentimes, uh, the the less things go right. I won't say that the service levels are, are lower, right? Because everyone's trying to do that. They're trying to keep those service levels up, but when there's no ships, if there's no trucks, if you can't get unloaded, if you're missing delivery dates, it's because of the chaos around you, not necessarily because uh, you, you, you're, not, you're not trying to provide the service that you want to, but you know, things go wrong. Uh, the higher the rates, the, the, the more things go wrong. The lower the rates, the, the smoother selling there is. Rates are like a sign, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's just you're, it's symbolizing what's happening. And it's almost people are charging for how hard they're working and how stressed out they are, right? <laughs> if it's really easy to service freight, then yeah, it, uh, maybe it doesn't, you know, that's where the market goes. But there's also a lot of economic factors at play and there's supply and demand crunches and a lot of different uh, variables in this equation that are leading into rates. And so, uh, mm -hmm. but it's really interesting to, to think about the perception of premiums versus elevated rates and what they are and how they play together. Yeah, and, and certainly in your sales game, right? Your, your sales process, to, to, to be able to identify that and, and sell to those points, right? And, and not try to somewhat hide those points, but to really sell to it. You know, to, to to sell to those points and and get out there in front of it and and be open, honest, transparent with your customers, and that is how you become a consultant. You just hit the nail right on the head. I mean, so much of sales is managing expectations, and if you can clearly communicate where the averages are and why they are what they are, and then you can say, here's what a premium is, and here's why that premium exists, and you can start building expectations, and then you need to be able to meet those expectations. Now you're setting yourself up for success, even in a chaotic situation through that, that transparency. You do, yeah. We are live on LinkedIn right now, and Ryan Milak, uh, dispatcher here on LinkedIn, says there are so many languages in this world, but they choose to speak facts. You are, you're Mr. Facts right there, too. And we have Nico <laughs> Brown here. Hello, neighbors, uh, or hi-ho, neighbors. Uh, hello to you, Nico. Uh, glad you're watching. So I, let's, uh, let's pivot and, and do the sonar chart of the day. We, yeah. we threw out a sonar chart earlier, but let's see what, what Richie has to say about what the market's doing right now. Yeah, so this is, uh, we're looking at outbound tender volume at the national level, uh, and you see 2020 in blue, and then you have the, the previous two years, 2019 and 18, uh, below uh, in, in yellow and green. And, and the thing to, to notice here is not only is there, you know, looking at this period of time from, you know, June or right after Memorial Day all the way through Labor Day, and you see that, you know, the two holidays represented by those dips. Now, seasonally, before the pandemic, it's been relatively flat in terms of volumes. If anything, volumes came down a little bit after Memorial Day uh, and, and stayed there before, before you know, hitting Labor Day uh, later on in the summer. But what we saw in the, the pandemic was that this skyrocketing of volumes, right? And um, it's kind of wrecking seasonal trends and I think that what's really going to be interesting is, you know, we know that volumes are going to be elevated in 2021, uh, but are they going to continue this trajectory of going up or are they going to, while staying elevated, flatten out as they did pre-pandemic? And all of this to say that, you know, seasonality or seasonal trends that, that were in supply chain and in transportation before the pandemic have crashed. They have fallen off a cliff and we, we see all of this volatility and markets that were normally not good for carriers are now healthy for carriers and vice versa. And, uh, you know, decisions that are being made on pre-pandemic seasonality may not be the wisest decisions <laughs> at, at this point. And so that opens up a lot of pain points in the marketplace. And I, and I think this leads into our guest today a bit as well, Kevin, but um, with all those pain points is the opportunity for new technology and people from the ground up to start um, innovating and, and, and creating some change in the marketplace that can be significant 
um, over time, but I think it's going to bubble up from the bottom as these small companies start to fill in these gaps and provide solutions to, uh, to the problems that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, you, you're going to see a lot of people come in and, and fill these gaps, these new patterns, right? And, and that's part of life, and, and we were talking about it just a second ago, life isn't linear. And this is part of the exponential part of life, of, of dynamics, large structure. Uh, what, what do you call them? Um, the hyper objects, yeah. Hyper objects, right? Like the economy. You know, certainly the world economy. There's, there's so many variables, different players, and, and it touches all life that uh, those are dynamic. Those are very adaptable and sometimes fragile as well. That they can get broken very quickly. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's always interesting to see when we'll get back to normal season patterns, if we will, if those are going to be changed in the long term, maybe short term, uh, but before, uh, before we really get back to, to true normal. So it's, it's always interesting. I need to talk about you know, new companies and new technologies, mm -hmm. I, and TAI is uh, TAI, yeah. right? TAI is, is one of our sponsors as well, and is a TMS, is the ultimate domestic 3PL solution for LTL and full truckload freight. TAI gives you a centralized platform for sourcing load coverage by connecting you to load boards, rate intelligence, and capacity tools on a single page. With TAI, you can automate your LTL shipments from quote to delivery and all the way through your accounting process. If you're a freight broker or 3PL trying to expand quickly, TAI offers unmatched speed and scalability. So thank great, you to TAI. Great yeah. folks over there, too. I, I've had numerous conversations with that team. Yeah, you team work with TAI quite a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. Great, great, great people. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so good plug there. <clears throat> yeah, so it's talking about niches, talking about seasonal patterns. Uh, we have Jerry Flynn here joining us now. And, you know, when you think about dry bulk, you, you think a lot about grains, you think about harvest season, and that is real seasonality, which mm -hmm. I hope those seasonal patterns don't get disrupted, <laughs> yeah. right? That's a bigger because problem. If, I know, that, that's, a, that's a bigger problem than, than any of us can, can tackle at all. But, uh, but Jared, thanks for uh, joining us today. Hey, Kevin, thanks for uh, having me on again. You bet. I anytime. So uh, for our audience out there who aren't familiar with yourself and, and BulkLoads.com, give us a, a brief introduction. Yeah, BulkLoads.com, we are a marketplace for bulk commodity uh, truckloads. So um, we're generically a load board uh, that we focus on hopper bottom freight, in dump freight, walking floors, basically all your dry and liquid bulk commodity trailers. So most of your raw uh, materials, all your core or all your feed grains, um, uh, fertilizers, all your ag inputs. Um, we do a fair amount of industrials, aggregates. Um, but yeah, anything you can think of as those raw commodities that get transported up and down the highways. Definitely. And it's really hard to find uh, trailer types too, you know, pneumatics, which is uh, you know, I, I've banged my head against a, a desk and a door and, and everything trying to find pneumatics <laughs> in my life. And, and I'm just glad I don't have to do that on a daily basis anymore. Uh, but, but Jared, so, so you started Bulk Loads. Hey, can you give us a, the origin story of Bulk Loads? Uh, when and how you started it? What gave you the idea? Kind of that, that origin story. Yeah, yeah. So I worked for a large grain company in Kansas City, um, started in, in 2005. And really, the, the heart of it was when I started there, um, actually, was, I think it was the second day on the job, the, the vice president of the company told me, he's like, Jared, just so you know, we're a logistics company that moves grain. And it took me for a while to kind of think about that. But he was right. Most of your, your, your grain trading companies they're, they're logistics supply chain companies um, that then move the product through the supply or they move it through the supply chain. And um, I really kind of took that to heart and I got to realize that, man, this this whole grain industry, it, it's all about the freight. And, and that's where I kind of really ran with it. And I just saw that there was such a need um, in the marketplace to produce a, a, a program to actually match up um, and help these companies um, with with the, the freight needs out there. Um, so that's kind of what really piloted it. Um, yeah, and in the beginning phases, um, I, Kevin, you can relate to this. Yeah, it was a lot of just cold calls. Uh, I, you said earlier, 100 plus calls a day, but just really getting the word out there. And I think it's interesting. It's a lot of people, you know, you always say certain industries are behind as far as technology goes. But yeah, I think especially in ours, we're dealing with, with agriculture 
and trucking, um, two, two industries that, that we always kind of deem maybe a little bit more behind than others when it comes to technology. So we, we really use that as our, as our tactic to really use um, digital technology to, to help match these trucks up with these shipping companies. That's, that's great. And um, I, I love hearing that. And, and I love the, the idea of identifying a niche, identifying something where you can provide value and, and going after it and doing it. What, what has been your strategy for educating your, you know, client base or those prospects? Because I imagine if, if people aren't accustomed to technology or they're a little bit behind, whether they're, they're on the agricultural side or the transportation side, you have to say, here's who we are and what we're doing and why, why you should trust us and, and so forth. What has that process been like for having those conversations when you're just trying to educate folks on, on what, you're, what you're all about? Yeah, well, you hit the nail on the head. I think it's really about building trust and people got to believe, they got to believe in you first before they believe in your product. And for me, or for us starting off, that was, that was really going out there and cold calling these clients and, and building that trust with them, let them know that, um, that we believe in this product and um, that it was going to work. And yeah, you, as Kevin said earlier, you, you, you know, you make a hundred calls, you hear all these no's, but you, you wait for that one yes answer um, to do that. But I think it's really just, yeah, telling that story um, of how you can help. We deal with a lot of small owner operators and you all know that our industry is, you know, 93% small owner operators. Um, a lot of these guys, um, struggle with technology. Um, uh, so we really, I think we've been very empathetic to that from our beginning. Um, we really related to these guys knowing that, hey, um, we're going to help you along the way. We're going to help you show how you can use um, an app, everything from how to download it um, to, to use it along the way. Because um, a lot of these guys, well, I, I always hate to say a lot of them, but a lot of these older guys, they don't, they want to use technology, but they're very fearful of it. They don't know what it's going to do, how it's going to use, um, they, they feel incompetent about it. But I think we have had such a passion to help these guys. So I guess our approach has always been with the trucker first, um, really showing how uh, these technologies can help them um, with their business. And I say help them, like really help fill in those needs. And um, it's been cool, you know, you, you hear all the stories, but over the years, it's been interesting we don't go out and ask, but it's, man, it's awesome when you hear somebody say, man, this, this product has changed my life. It's, it's helped me gather more business leads or and more business than I've ever had. I've had people tell me that, and, and it's, I say this funny, they, they've used our product so much that they don't need it anymore. They've gained so much business, which we love to hear. It's, it's like, we, we want you to continue to use it, but they said that they've gained so many contacts and long lasting relationships. And that's something that we pride ourselves on. We don't want you to come in and use it one time and be done. We want you to build that customer base and continue to use it um, and be more profitable with it. So yeah, that's the heart of it. And our passion is really helping connect those, those small guys that may not have the sales force and the power um, to go out and, and find these connections and bring them um, right, right in front of their face on an app. Yeah. I mean, because, it's a load board, it's marketplace, you know, it's bringing to, together two different parties or maybe sometimes three different parties for, for transactions. And when you started out, uh, you know, telling your story, gaining trust, uh, what did you find effective? Because, you know, when you, or whenever you come out with a new product or new concept, it's often hard to explain to people, especially in a cold call, because you don't have much time, you have to get the hook in and you have to be able to yeah. explain this idea that you have in your head because oftentimes it's, it's more of an idea than something tangible that, that you can show and, and how to, to draw their attention and, and get buy-in. Did, did, did you find your own I, it, it, Tell us about the path of finding your own way uh, of, of being able to, to come down and be able to, to, to have that concept in hand, you know, because it's a, a storytelling journey from what doesn't work to, to what really resonates. Yeah. So with any marketplace you got to have, and, and in our instance, you got to have three parties. You have your, your trucking companies, your carriers, you got your freight brokers and you got your shippers and you got to get them all interacting at once. We always call it the chicken and egg effect because, you know, and there's different, you know, the market's never equal supply to demand. It's either you got crazy supply or more loads and you got trucks or trucks and you got loads. And it always just depends on where we where we um, were in that segment during the years, you know. So if it was a high 
you know, a lot of uh, truck demand, high loads and, and very few trucks. And we, we target the shippers because we knew that we could go out there and sell that story that we can help you find capacity um, by using our product. Um, if it was, you know, um, low amount of loads and, and high trucks, we go out there and target the trucks because we knew that, that, that these guys needed loads to haul. So it was always I, it was always kind of that stair step approach. Uh, depending on the the time of year or when the market was, uh, you know, was it more favorable for for trucking companies at the time or for shippers and brokers? Um, so that was the approach. I think really it was just you know trying to find that time and like any sales and marketing strategy, it just, it's just it's the follow ups, continuing to talk to them. You know, ten years ago, more people obviously responded to the phone, so you could. You know, you can make those calls um, and, and talk to more people. Today, it's a, you got to use a little bit more tactics. I mean, it, you know, you try with a phone call. If not, you, you, you send them a text message, you send them an email, a follow up. Um, so I think, you know, the strategy is still the, cha- the same. Your communication method has, has changed uh, for us just on how we how we talk to these people. Obviously, so many people get bombarded with phone calls that if they don't recognize a phone call to a certain extent. Some people don't answer them. So we got to be cognitive. How do we? How do we talk to those people and, and how do we get in the door to, to show them our product? Yeah, we've, we've, we've talked about that in some previous calls about the, uh, the evolution of, of cold calling and reaching out and, and getting in touch with people. Um, I'm curious to, to, to hear why, you know, like what, what was the, the big motivation to jump in, start a business go through the hard work of getting the snowball rolling from nothing and, and gaining that initial momentum, what, what was the, the underlying motivation that you had that said, I want to go lock myself in a room and make 200 calls a day and try to start something and, and, uh, and really get something up and running? You know, I think it was, it, there was always something in me innate um, that had that drive. Um, I look back and, and kind of my um, my careers before, I had some pretty good uh, managers and mentors that always told me, Jared, I see something very special with you. I think I took those words of like, man, there's there's some opportunities for me. And, and I think it took those people to believe in me to, for me to have the confidence to do this. Um, but I think it was enough of those people that told me that to say, man, I think I think I have what it takes. I think I have what it takes for people to believe in me if I can sell that story. So I think that was the heart of it. Um, and then having my experience in trucking and dealing with these, I've been so empathetic um, to, to these carriers out there today. And this is my personal view. Um, a lot of these owner operators, man, they get beat up out there um, um, in society. They're, they're, they're beat up on, on rates. They're beat up um, on the roads, you know, dealing with traffic. A lot of these places they go to pick up, those people sometimes don't want them there. Where they deliver, they don't want them there. They're bad, they're, they're bad on weather. So these guys are, they're, I mean, they're getting, you know, they're in war all the time. And for me, it was a strategy to say, man, we can help you. And I can relate with that. I drove a truck for a while. I knew those experiences. One of my first jobs out of college, um, I did deliveries and I saw those, um, those problems that existed out there. Um, for these guys. So I think that's where I just had a passion for this. Um, I, I grew up on a farm and, um, and had the ins and outs of just knowing agriculture. And so there was a passion there to say, man, I, I love this industry. Um, in agriculture, there's, there's a lot of, um, kind of just that, that good old, good old boy, I guess mentality is the best way to say it. Um, so there was a passion there and I saw, man, there was two opportunities here. I could, I could deal with trucking and agriculture and bring those things together and, and use my knowledge and expertise and bring that. So, yeah, it's been a journey and, um, you know, it, it's just awesome when you hear those stories of those people. Um, I feel like you can just relate to them. I, I've been there and done that uh, for some of these guys. And even today, like I said, there's just so much more I think we can do um, in business and in society to, to help these guys that are moving, quote, food for America and putting this on our on our dinner plates. There's so many people, um, even today, they don't realize how that steak ends up you know, at the grocery store or, you know, even back on all that, how that cow was grown or, you know, grown and fed and, and all those ingredients. Um, so it's such a cool story, you know, when you think about it from the beginning uh, of, of how this whole supply chain works, especially from the, from the agricultural standpoint. So if we look at, it, you know, it's a, it's, you know, a load board marketplace, you have to have scale. You have to get scale on both sides of it. 
So how long did it take you to, to, to get that scale and when did you realize it, right? When, when was that aha? It's like, oh man, this is gonna finally work because there's enough people on the platform to, to make it liquid, right? Yeah, for us, I would say, because we launched in 2011, um, we just celebrated our 10 year uh, anniversary this past April. I would say it was probably in year four for us when we realized that, hey, this product is is, is working. Um, we're starting to get, you know, we're getting feedback from people. And just like any business, you know, when you when you first push it out there and you have that first product, you figure out what people like and what they dislike and you build on what they like and then you correct the issues that they dislike. So, you know, there were certain metrics that we saw that that, that, that shippers wanted more than just you know, they wanted more than just posting a load out there. They wanted to see more visibility of carriers. They wanted easier ways to connect with them. They wanted um, ways that they could send instant messages to these guys and relate to them. Um, we found, you know, from our apps how to, you know, how to really segment and target um, certain loads that these guys would want. But to, to set up basically preferences for our carriers, um, you know, I just heard it earlier, but, you know, in this industry, it's all about the, taking less steps. Um, in whatever process you're doing it. And so that was for us, like really every day figuring out those steps and every business says that, but man, we really, every, every support that comes in, every request, we, we vet it and have we done them all? No, but we really look through it. And, you know, if some of these look very viable, you know, we adapt and, and we, we cater to those customers that want those requests. Yeah. And, and you know, we're talking about sales, but, but once you rescale, you can do more marketing than then sells. And one of the things that you've done uh, for, for a number of years, uh, ever since I was a subscriber to, to bulk loads myself, is that daily newsletter, where oftentimes, yeah. and probably you need more Freight Waves content on there, uh, but you, yes. do, you do send out a lot of Freight Waves content, and you send out your news headlines, and also your, your chat boards uh, that, that you yep. have active there, which are some of the most entertaining reading in the world. <laughs> it's like freight guard reports almost. It's, it's, it's in that caliber of, of reading. Uh, people going back and forth on, on the chat boards. But uh, you know, tell me about the newsletter, how you started the newsletter, and, and kind of what benefits and, and, and what sales that you've been driving with that daily morning newsletter. Yeah, so we allowed anybody, um, even non-members, to subscribe to the newsletter. And a lot of times, if they if they were checking us out, we would we'd vet them and put them in there um, into that sales funnel, I guess you would call it. Um, and then that way, we could start catering to them. And when they signed up, we could figure out where they were based out of, and then we could actually start sending them information, that load information, if it was a carrier that would match up. So yeah, it was a great sales way to our tactic to show these guys that their loads. That match up in their area um and that you know, we still send the same message out every day we've modified it over the years one thing that was interesting you know we used to always and this was just kind of a, a tip we used to always lay it label a daily email or whatever well what we start doing is we start featuring the actual news content in the subject line of the email so it was less about bulk loads daily email and it was like you know uh, trucker experienced this on the highway or DOT mandates this or something like that. And that's what grabbed the attention. Well, they would open that up. They can go to the article. Well, then they're right back where we want them on our load board. So it was a great sales tactic to bring them back in um, and show them, you know, something that might spark their interest from a business standpoint and not just newsworthy. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's, it's providing value initially, and that's a great way of building trust. If you can provide that value before someone's a client, then they're going to trust you more and, and, and want to go forward. Um, now that you're, you know, 10 years, uh, congratulations, by the way, you got that you. momentum building. Um, you know, we were just talking about how oftentimes in big complex systems, like real change kind of bubbles up from below. And when I think about transportation, I think about owner operators and the, the, the way that the industry can really change and shift is if these owner operators are more empowered and, and so forth. Where do you see things going in the future? What, what can bulk loads do for, for the industry, for these owner operators, for shippers, and just the, the whole landscape? Uh, I'm curious to, to hear about your vision going forward. Yeah, so I'll back up just a little bit. You know, one thing, another business that we, we launched five years ago, um, we, when we launched bulk loads, we had a lot of carriers signing up. And uh, when we, we get them signed up, a lot of these guys would ask us, well, how do I get paid? Well, as a load board, you, you, you invoice whatever company, brokerage or shipper, 
well, a lot of these companies start asking us for um, factoring service recommendations. And there was some that I knew that out there that already existed. Um, but we saw a need um, specifically to, to help these guys in that arena. And then, yeah, I guess it was 2014 or 15 is when we launched Smart Freight Funding. And it's a totally separate entity. Um, but we work together to promote that. Um, but we've been able to see kind of what companies these guys need factoring services on. So, you know, a lot of these guys, they don't need factoring for every company. And there's some of these companies that pay very efficiently. But we can help and assist them on some of these that are, you know, the plus, you name it, 20, 30, 45, some of them 60 plus days out. Um, so that was a solution that we saw five years ago um, that's been um, that's grown and been very successful since um, then. Um, that's our smart freight funding Two or three years ago, and I've been on the show and talked about this, um, our goal has really been to continue to refine, we call it the load life cycle. Um, but how do we help not just making that initial connection, but every other process that's along the way. Um, and that's where uh, two years ago we launched, we call it bulk TMS, but it's a TMS program specific for the bulk commodity market. And we've taken a lot of knowledge just from our, our core base and really developed a software system that really centers around bulk commodities, which, you know, people say freight's freight, but it's really, really different when you're dealing with grain and feed. Um, the very, payments very are made different. different. It's very different. Very so different. we had to develop a solution or software that really caters to the, the, the bulk commodity industry. Um, and that's when we launched two years ago. Um, uh, we're still developing it out. I mean, it's it's live, um, but we're continuing to build it out. Um, we've got some um, fairly large uh, companies that are using it now and smaller mid-sized companies. Um, but that's been another one that we continue to develop out. I think that's where we see, I mean, it, it's, and, and there's been other uh, companies out there in the same space that are, that are doing the same thing, but it's really continuing to look at this whole load life cycle and how can we assist in it? You know, bulk loads, we don't ever want to compete against our clients, but we want to help assist them along the way and be that, that, that solution or technology, um, you know, whether it's from a tracking standpoint, load visibility, um, again, payment. Um, we've seen a big need over the past couple of years, especially in the grain industry. Um, companies want to get um, bill ladings and documents back quicker. So it's developing those solutions so that we can get those documents back as quickly as possible uh, to that, that grain company or shipping company that needs it. Yeah, so it's really about building an ecosystem, right? It's, it's that yeah. end to end, you know, you captured that customer and yep. it's selling more products and services and adding value really to, to those same customers as opposed to, to always continuously having one product and going out and trying to, to gain market share as, as, as the biggest tool in your toolbox. But if you can create an ecosystem and, and drive complementary products and, and value to the your same set of customers, it, it's got to... Uh, it, it, Usually that's a much more profitable business than always grabbing market share. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And for us, we're always looking at, you know, we're a membership business. Um, most of your load boards are. And for us um, and my, my father-in-law, he's been assistant. He, uh, he, he worked for a large company that they had a membership model, but he always instilled me. He's like, continue to increase membership value. You want that value every year to be more or exceed where it was a year before. So that's something that we really look at, you know, every day and as we continue to develop, how do we continue to, to exceed or increase the value of that membership than what it was before? Yeah, it's great. That's, you know, you're empowering those companies to be able to go out and do what they are doing and, and be more efficient and effective and profitable. And so it's, you're, you're, creating an environment where all the different entities can be more successful together. Um, and there's not so much competing, uh, you know, and, and infighting. That's, that's fantastic. You know, the thing that jumps off, you know, listening to you talk is, you know, you're, you're listening to the market, you're listening to your clients, you have an awareness of needs when, and when they come up and you're uh, real thoughtful in, in bringing, you know, technology solutions to the table. Um, is that, 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 that listening, is that something that you've always had? Is it just kind of natural or have you developed it? Or um, I'm, I'm curious to you know, learn more and hear more about you know, what you've done to grow that skill of, of being an active listener. So I will say that it can almost be a negative in a way. And, and I'll put it this way. Um, we try to listen to, to everyone um, that comes through I have a hard time telling people no. 
<laughs> for a lot. I mean, in, in all facets, and it's just something. I guess it's probably the the people pleasing part of me, um, and it's. It, 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 I probably need to say no more often, but I, I think it's maybe come a little bit more national or natural because for me, if someone's paying paying me for a product or service that they're going to use, I'm going to do everything possible to to make sure that I'm delivering on that. Um, so I think for me, I don't want to fail my client or my customer. Um, I, I want them to be impressed, um, know that they can reach out to us. And I think it's something that I'm, I, I take it hard when I say that. So it's, uh, it's, it's probably been the same from the very beginning. I think for me, it, it's trying to funnel it down um, to, where it, to where we can do it in a systematic way. Um, obviously, we, you can't say yes to everything that comes through. We got to bet things, um, but it's, um, it's something that we take very serious. So we have the Owner Operator Summit coming up tomorrow, June 9th, all day. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. We're going to focus on owner operator issues. I, you talk to a lot of owner operators. You have a lot of most, most, you know, on the carrier side, quite a quite a bit, or either small fleets or owner operators working in the ag markets. What, what's some of their, their biggest concerns right now? And you know, what are the challenges uh, of marketing uh, products and services to uh, was well, a very large group. It's a very diverse group. That, that a lot of people don't realize until they actually start marketing to owner ops? It's a great question. When we talk to, to a lot of our clients daily, I think there's, number one, I think there's always uncertainty for driver recruitment. Um, I mean, that's something you're always going to hear over and over. Uh, you talk to guys all the time that they have, even these smaller owner operators with, with um extra trucks and trailers that, that are parked. Um, they can't find the driver to, to fill those shoes. I think that's one that we, we, we constantly hear. I think these guys are very concerned on government regulations and rightfully so, and, and how that affects their business. I think from an owner operator standpoint, some of these feel like some of these regulations are unfavorable to them and more favorable to larger fleets. Um, so I think that's something that, that's, that we have to wrestle that these guys wrestle with trying to figure out how do they stand out in the marketplace. Again, there's very little control when it's a, when it's a government regulation, you gotta, you know, you gotta abide by it. So how can you adapt to that and, and still be profitable and successful in your business? Um, so I, I think that's a huge one that, that we deal with. Um, these guys, believe it or not, I mean, they're always looking at in efficiencies and technologies, you know, how do they increase fuel efficiency um, on the rigs? How do they, you know, what are they doing? To, to continue to innovate uh, a lot of these processes that they're doing. I think, you know, visibility is a big one now. Um, it's just a common one. You know, you got, it's, it's easier for these larger fleets to, to adapt that change, but these small owner operators um, to, to create more visibility for their clients, I think is, is one that, that, that they are looking at to, to how do they adapt and overcome and provide those solutions uh, to those companies. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, one thing I was thinking I was going to joke with you about this is, yeah. you know, when you're right for sales, when you say, I have a hard time saying I no. I know, right? <laughs> I have a hard time saying no. Yeah. I know. I, I think a lot of a lot of good salespeople, they're, they're easy to sell to, too, because yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an easy person to sell. <laughs> I, I really am. How about you, Jared? Are you an easy person to sell? Can you, you know, easy, you easy person to sell, too. Yeah, but... Sucker, uh, I'm are those, you a sucker? Yeah, I'm one of those when, uh, like, my wife gets gets in furious. Like, if there's someone out selling someone, you know, she's like, "Don't make eye contact." I'm like, "Why? I want us to see what they have to sell." She's like, "No, then you'll get sold." To, you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm one of those. I want to hear the sales pitch. I want to see what you know how they how they're going to sell it to. Maybe there's something I can learn from that. You know, it's one thing. Uh, I now that we've grown to where we are, um, very blessed, um, very thankful. But it's one thing that I do miss is the sales calls because that's when you get to really learn your client. I still try to do a little bit of it, but um, you know, my time spent more um, managing other people that are doing those calls. Um, so it's something that I still I struggle with because I still want to know what's going on. You know, what are the the guys that are on the ground, the troops that are out there calling? What are they hearing from their clients? So I always want to make sure that. But yeah, that's the heart and soul of it, man. I'm a I'm a sales guy from. You know, that's an interesting, uh, interesting you say that, right? Because in the early days, you were selling your product. It's your company. It's your baby. It's your child now. It's almost a teenager. It, it, it's getting that way. 
So, uh, and there's a lot of great salespeople out there that, that get promoted, they have to transition to being a sales manager, which is yep. very different from being a salesperson. And I would like to hear your advice and what you've learned by transitioning out of doing those 100 co calls to managing other people making sales for you. So for us as a company, we, we have, um, uh, a, we call it a, a morning sales meeting. Um, usually it's led by, um, you know, a three or four minute uh, video that we find. There's some that we uh, subscribe to on YouTube, but it's any kind of sales strategy and that kind of starts the conversation. Um, and then after that, we kind of go around the room and we talk about what's working and what's not working, any follow-ups on that. That's how I kind of stay in the know um, by, by having that meeting with uh, our team every, um, every morning. Um, and it, I guess it kind of starts the day. So that, that's how we that's how we do it. Um, we have one person that's kind of in charge of the rest of the sales team um, that reports directly to me. But um, yeah, I think it's something you just can't you can't lose focus. And, and you said this earlier, like you know, when, you, when it's your company, you have the passion to sell it. You know, how do you how do you create that same passion for others in there? And again, truth be told, nobody's ever going to have the same passion as yours. It's not their you know their business. But how do you continue? How do you create that much passion um, that way? Because in our business, when you're cold calling, you know, people, all they hear is voice and tonality and all that. You know, how do they hear that same passion that you have when you're on the phone? Um, how, how do your employees resonate or, or pass that uh, that same passion on? Yeah, it's great stuff. You know, I was, I was going to ask the same question. So, oh, you were? Yeah, you stole my question. Oh, that, that's okay. <laughs> but, that's okay. I, we have, uh, you know, I, on a serious note, uh, this is something more, more on market intelligence and, and since... You know, agriculture, trucking, kind of in the wild, wild west a lot of times. We've had some articles here at FreightWaves.com and some investigations uh, about double brokering. We had a show about it last week with, with Alex Schnitzer over mm -hmm. at Chariot Logistics. And, you know, as a, as a broker and uh, I just worked there as a shipper too. So, I mean, there's some, some, there's some players out there that are... Nefarious, they're charlatans, right? They uh, are up to no good. So, uh, kind of, how do you police uh, the load board, and, and kind of, what are you seeing out there in ways of a fraudulent activity that you'd like to to warn people about? Yeah. So, our marketplace, we've set some some um, parameters up where it's very transparent. So. If, if there's ever, you know, you spoke, you talked about our forums earlier, that's one of the best sources if something needs to get said about anybody. I mean, and, you know, good or bad, like if there's something going on that, pe that people need to know about, usually it gets posted out there. And we got to police it for, you know, to make sure that it's truthful and there's no, um, mm -hmm. that's one way that we create a lot of transparency is by, you know, that being out there for people to use it as a sounding board. Um, if there's any issues of double brokering or um, of that sort, um, we have a rating system um, similar to other marketplaces like Amazon, where where companies can be rated. That's a great sounding board, and I would say not so much even the double brokering, but if there's ever payment issues um, with a company, um, uh, that can be a great place where it, it can kind of start the process. And it, it's crazy how quick those get resolved because nobody wants a negative or a one star rating, yeah. you know, listed on their account when they got a load posted out there. I mean, uh, we've had several companies that they try to get those resolved very fast. So those are the ways that we, we combat it. Um, we do field phone calls from time to time, knock on wood, the ones that we don't like to deal with. Um, but yeah, we take that very serious um, to make sure that, that people are working and in our industry. It's, it's, it's really interesting. We don't have as many freight brokers in the bulk hauling industry. It's just, it doesn't, it just doesn't exist like it does in the general van reefer flatbed industry. Most of the bar companies are, are grain trading um, companies. It's usually merchandisers. They own the, the product or commodity that they're that they're posting and shipping it out there. Um, so we probably don't have to deal with it as much. There is confusion. By, some companies do get confused because some people refer to grain traders as grain brokers. And there are grain mm -hmm. brokers out there. But most of these companies are grain traders. So they actually physically own the commodities that they're posting and shipping and on. And they're registered with the, the SEC, and I, I think you have to have a Series 3, basically, to, to trade grain and arrange transportation for that, yep. right? So there, there's, there is exactly a level right. of, of regulatory hurdles um, that yep. you don't see in, in freight brokerages and, and other parts of the industry. 
Yep, that's exactly right. But yeah, for the most part, we, you know, it, there there are freight brokers in our industry, but just not to the near extent that that there is in the general freight hauling. So, hey, going back to, to 10 years, if looking backwards, what would you do differently? What what things have you learned? Are, are there any things that you would have done differently? And then <clears throat> what decisions are you really proud about and would have done not differently, <laughs> would have done exactly the same? Yeah, really good questions. You know, so we bootstrapped ourselves from the very beginning. Um, it was myself making cold calls and my um, my another partner that, that owns the, the business. He's been more the technical development piece of it. I underestimated how big of a marketplace it could really be. And I say that, that we probably, I wish we would have probably grown faster in the, in the early phases. Um, we really didn't start adding staff until we really knew that we had a, a marketplace and knew that it was, you know, by the time we were year four or five, well, then when we added that staff and started adding those salespeople, our, our sales just exploded from there. And I look back and it's like, why, why, why didn't we, you know, look even early on to do that. Maybe we didn't have the cash flow to support that. Maybe that was one reason, but to look at it, it's like, man, could we have grown this even faster by having more of that sales and marketing force in the very beginning um, versus halfway down the road? Um, so that's probably one of the the, the bigger ones that, that stands out as far as if, if I could go back and, and look at it. You know, and it's interesting, you know, we're in this big digital transformation right now. I look back and, you know, we didn't, and again, I always say we, we listen to our customers and respond to feedback. I wish I would have known that this digital transformation would have been so much bigger because now it's kind of a, you know, we're trying to push out development so much faster. And it's like, wow, I wish we would have known back to the document flow that that was a big need. We just never, it was never asked until now. Um, so we're trying to meet that demand now or we have the solutions for it. But if I look back, it's like, wow, I wish we would have figured that out maybe even five, six years ago. Um, that it was that it was something that was needed, but to that certain extent, I'll, I'll end on this. There was a lot of these grain trading companies that, you know, five years ago, people didn't want digital documents; they wanted original bill ladings, and there was a couple reasons for that. I mean, I even talked to a person last week. You know, it was a way that they could delay payment until that until that invoice came in. They didn't have to pay. Versus if it gets, you know, if you take a picture and hit send, you can have it within minutes. So there was some purpose behind that. You know, five years ago. There, some of the technology wasn't out there where you could have a, a legible digital document um, that would suffice. So a lot of companies just didn't want it. Well, after COVID, a lot of these companies realized that, it, that it's the way that they had to do business because they were working remote. Um, and now it's it's an industry standard that you can have digitized documents. So that's another one I look at. I kind of beat myself up being like, I wish we could have known a little bit more. I wish we could have adapted or seen this coming faster than, what, than the way it happened. Yeah, it's it's what you said earlier in the, in the show, right? You know, it makes sense. Life makes sense backwards, but you got to live it forwards. And you don't know what you don't know, and you, you learn. You just keep grinding away, and uh, and hope. Uh, and, yeah, as long as you keep grinding away, doing the right things, things will work out in the end. A lot of times, not the way you you anticipated they worked out, but oftentimes it's better than that. So, uh, Jared, thank you so much for stopping by today on Put That Coffee Down. And where does our audience reach out to contact you directly, learn about bulkloads.com, and get a sneak peek on those great message boards that you yeah. never know what they're talking about, and sometimes you, you wish you hadn't seen it. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, if you're out there listening and, and, you know, whether you're a shipping company or logistics company handling bulk commodity freight or it's something you want to look at, um, maybe it's a niche. We talked to a lot of people that, you know, their core is, is van freight, but they have this one customer that they deal with some bulk and they don't know how to, uh, you know, how to find that and come find us. Uh, the easiest way, just look us up on our web website, bulkloads.com. Again, we, we have good old-fashioned customer support, so you can always get somebody by calling pretty much 24-7. Um, our toll-free number is 800-518-9240. You're always going to hit it. You're always going to get someone to answer. I guarantee it. Thank you so much, Jared. Always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, take care. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Bye. Always good to talk to, to, to people who have found a niche and have built a business over the long term, right? Mm -hmm. Because all, all these businesses you, you see, and whether it's a, a business, whether it's your sales book of business, it's all done over time. The first year or two, 
is just making those connections, building up, having conversations, getting, putting, really putting yourself in the position to have exponential growth because life's not linear, right? Exactly. And, and, you know, he listens. You know, the thing that, that was my takeaway there is that he is truly listening to the industry, to the owner operators, to the shippers, to the whole market, all the different players in the market. He's, he's in tune, he has an awareness, and through that listening, it's very clear to him what needs to be done, or where those opportunities lie, and, uh, and that opens up these, these opportunities for him to start this business and start meeting these needs. And you, know, you can tell just listening to him uh, that his passion is empowering these owner operators and mm -hmm. helping them uh, be more effective in their businesses. And, and uh, I think some of the best businesses out there are, are businesses where the focus is on other people right from the beginning. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, and you can see that. There. It really is. And it is, it's such a specialization. I always say I love niches. Niches <laughs> have the riches, right? Yeah. And I, I love the niche because. And I didn't really appreciate it until I got into uh, my last freight brokerage slash shipper job before I started Carryless was with a mining company out in Western Oklahoma. And that is so specialized, you know? It, it's like, it, it's round trip. I mean, there's no one ways, right? There's no backhauls. You're mm -hmm. paying for the backhaul because there, there's really nothing to come out because if you're talking about grain season, you're taking it from the harvest where all the grain is and you're taking it to the silo, and sometimes you know that's a short haul, sometimes it's a medium, I, you know, sometimes it's a long haul, right? Mm -hmm. it, it really depends, but uh, there, there's no grain to pick up where they're going, right? I mean, which makes sense. Um, <laughs> or, or any other substances, you know, lime or gypsum or anything like, like that, that they can take back. So it, it's, it's hard to find some of these special ice carriers sometimes. Uh, and uh, I make jokes about pneumatics all the time because you don't ever want to look for a pneumatic uh, <laughs> be, because it's going to take you a week to, uh, to get one in if, if, you don't, if you don't have them on speed dial. And, and that's where, you know, marketplaces come in. You know, it matches that, that capacity. And, and agriculture, as, as Jared said, is, is still low tech. It's still low tech. It, it's very customizable. A lot of premiums attached to it. It's, it's a high cost of the, the, the actual product on the trailer. But so it has you, to be very efficient. You see that with the onset of COVID. COVID mm -hmm. has been the bully on the edge of the cliff that's pushing people over into technology. It right? is. And so with everybody going remote and working from home, now faxing stuff doesn't make as much sense. And actual documents don't, you know, they might have COVID on them. I don't know. So like, <laughs> it's true. You know, it's so, contactless you exactly. know, delivery and stuff. But yeah, load document. Is something that, that the industry surely needs because I started in, in I think 2011 uh, and I hadn't seen a fax machine in a while <laughs> and I walked into a freight brokerage and there's a fax machine and, and that was a normal course of business you're faxing right. things back and forth and uh, it was insane it's still insane there's something about having like a physical document in your hands where you're like this is a real thing that isn't really replaced with viewing something, but I think that's, that's slowly changing. I think that uh, platforms that are trustworthy are, uh, are changing. I hope it's changing. Yeah. I hope it's changing. Me too. Because, if, if, <laughs> you know, you, you have a deal on the table, you have a load, but it's held up by the insurance agent who's at lunch, of course, because all insurance agents uh, have a three-hour lunch. And you're waiting for this fax to come back, and you're just washing that fax machine. <laughs> it's like a comedy of errors sometimes, but you know that's just me talking about transportation. Let's talk about the owner operator, the small fleet, and the owner operator conference summit coming up. Or next virtual summit starts at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, we have a great stable of uh, uh, speakers, starting with Rob Essies, uh, who's uh, the president of Essies Express, uh, talking to our very own George Abernathy. Should be great. It should be great. It should be really good. We have Adam Wingfield. We have Ashwin uh, Vesduvan, sorry, uh, <laughs> Bailey Woods, yeah, the head of CVTA, talking about vehicle inspections, especially for owner operators. We have Blythe Brumleaf from Cyberly talking about marketing, yeah. website creation, marketing, and tools to, to really get your small fleet or owner operator business off the ground, start Huge. developing those relationships with uh, both shippers and brokers, and starting to be able to, to, to get more. More, uh, more activity and you know, great tools like Sonar, 
we're going to have Luke and Kyle from with Sonar uh, talking to the owner operators about using Sonar. So join us 9 a.m. tomorrow. This wraps up this episode of Put That Coffee Down. See you next week. I got friends only want to talk business. I got expensive because wind is expensive. I got expensive because wind is expensive. I've been reading all the work. And I've been shutting down the stars.